Secretary orientation meeting. I'm just joking. FAFSA meeting, right? <laughs> okay. Welcome to our FAFSA. Actually, I got one laugh over here. Thank you for laughing at that. Um, so we're going to go get started since I know we um, we want to get going with this. So we're not here all night. Um, so this meeting is going to be basically two parts. So the first part is University of Ashland. I'm sorry, it's Ashland University is going to present, do they have a slideshow, and they're going to talk about financial aid and talk about FAFSA. And then once they're done with their presentation, you will be allowed to, at that point, to work on the FAFSA yourselves. We have computer labs here, so you're welcome to come check out a computer if that's easier to work on the computer, if you'd like to do that. And the great thing about doing that is that if you have questions in the fa about the application, you have, we have four experts here. So we have three representatives from Ashland University, and we have a representative here from University of Akron. So we have the experts. These people live in this world of financial aid, uh, whereas us guidance counselors do not live in that world. So if you have questions, um, these are the people to ask you. And it's a lot easier to ask them here in person than try to call and not talk to someone, because as you know, that can be sometimes challenging to get through um, to the universities. So um, I want to say something about scholarships here real quick before you get started. So the FAFSA, process is how you go about applying for um, student aid through the, the, the FAFSA application. For those students who are here and for the parents who are here, the scholarship process um, goes in um, pretty much full effect after Christmas. So during Christmas break, you will all receive a scholarship book um, from the Community Foundation mailed to your house. It's a beautifully um, hardbound it's not hardbound, it just staples it, but it's like thick paper. So it's a nicely bound <laughs> book that you can look at that has a couple hundred, uh, couple hundred scholarships in there that will be uh, available for you guys to apply for in the spring. So students, make sure you look at Naviance. We talked about that a few weeks ago when we came in the classrooms of Naviance. You can see where they, we post those scholarships in Naviance. You can see them. So most of the scholarships, though, that we have here in Wayne County and in the schools are in the spring. So. That's a big thing. We have a ton that are available for Western High School students. Make sure you take advantage of that. And the other scholarship opportunities you might find would be through the universities that uh, you get accepted to. So get your applications into the, to the different colleges you're interested in. So when you find out which, which colleges you're accepted to, then you can look on their website to see when those scholarships are available there. Okay. Um, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and start the meeting here now. Uh, I'll, if, um, you, uh, I'm sorry, Lori. Lori's gonna come up here and she's gonna talk about financial aid. So, thank you. Oh yes, yeah, so I was gonna say too, like after that, you don't have to stay to do the application. If you want to just stay for the slideshow, you're welcome to leave after the slideshow is over if you wanna work on that on your own, but you're welcome to stay here and work on that with the, with the uh, financial aid experts. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lori One, and I'm here with my teammates, Carissa and Drew. Um, and we want to thank Worcester High School for holding this event tonight and allowing us to come. We also want to thank Jamie and her crew for inviting us. And um, we also want to thank you for coming um, because events like this are important. Your future is important. <coughs> and anything we can do to help you be successful, that's why we're here. Um, we're not here for ourselves. Otherwise, we'd be home eating dinner or watching football or something interesting. <laughs> All right. Um, keep in mind, the information we're sharing with you tonight is not Ashland University information. It's information that is good for any school after high school that you want to go to. If it's a community college, if it's a four-year university, if you're going into a graduate program, this information pertains to you. All right, you all um, received a handout when you came in, so sometimes we'll refer to that. But keep in mind, FAFSA stands for a free application for federal student aid. Notice the free is underlined. A lot of people will say, well, why do I have to fill out a FAFSA? I'm not going to get anything anyway. You don't know that if you haven't filled out a FAFSA. Also, a lot of us, and I'm sure COVID probably brought this to the forefront, 
have unexpected things happen in our lives. Maybe it's an illness, maybe it's an accident, maybe it's a job loss. You just never know when something's going to come up where you need a little bit of help to finish your education. If you've already got your FAFSA completed, we can help immediately. If you haven't done your FAFSA, then we have to wait until you get it submitted, it gets processed, it comes back. That aid could be delayed anywhere from two weeks to four weeks, if not longer, depending on what may need done. So please don't think, oh, I don't need to do a FAFSA, it's not important. It actually is. Um, and it is available to start filling out now. It comes out October 1st of every year. The first three steps we're going to go through tonight are creating your FSA ID, which is your username and password. And keep in mind that the student creates one and the parent creates one. And they can't match because you both have to sign the FAFSA using this ID. So you've got to have your own. Step two will be actually completing the FAFSA, and step three will be reviewing your student aid report that you get once your FAFSA has been submitted and processed. So how many of you have already completed a FAFSA, either for a previous child, previous student, maybe yourselves? If you've already created an FSA ID, that still works. You don't have to create a new one every year. You do have to submit a FAFSA every year. You can't just do one now and say, oh, it's good for four years. You have to do a new one annually. So um, your FSA ID allows you to sign your FAFSA electronically, and that's going to speed things up considerably. Having to sign a paper FAFSA and mail it in, everyone knows the mail's a lot slower these days than it used to be, and if you mail it in, they're still gonna send you um, your report and confirmation that they received it via email. So if you do mail it in, make sure you put an email address on there, but keep in mind it's gonna take a lot longer to get it processed. Okay, um, once you have created your FSA ID, keep in mind you can also use it on other federal websites. And only the owner of each ID should create it and not share it. So again, the student creates one with their own password, the parent creates one with their own password. Don't put in your child's name and your social security number or vice versa. I can't tell you what a mess that is to try and clean up, and we don't get results that way. Can you say that place that you want to Don't put in, yes, don't put in your name and your child's social security number, or their name and your social security number, or a brother or sister's social security number. They have to match exactly, or we never get the results. Does that happen a lot? More often than we'd like, yes. Sure you saw your name correctly too. Right. Do I put in my grandson's name with the one I'm filling out now or mine? If you're creating your FSA ID, you want to put in your name and your social because you're going to have to enter that to sign his FAFSA once he completes it. He will have to have his own FSA ID with his name and his social so that he can sign it. If they match, then it's only got one signature and it gets rejected. He doesn't have to fill out the FAFSA form himself. He doesn't have to, but we actually advise that you let the student at least do it while you watch or help them because it's a great way to get them started on adulting. Keep in mind, once they get to school and they have to do their own classes and homework and get themselves out of bed and the whole bit, this is a great way to get that started. Start making them responsible. Keep in mind that the loans and stuff that they may get after completing their FAFSA are in their name. When they graduate, they have to pay it back. It's not in the parent's name or the grandparent's name. 
It's in theirs. Any other questions? Yeah. You have two students in college same time. Do they each have to fill one out? Yes. Okay. Yes, they are social security number specific. Speaking of that, a lot of times college applications or the common application that you might fill out for school, they cannot legally require you to submit your social security number. But if you don't submit your social security number, we will never get your FAFSA results because that's how the information from COD talks to the information we have. That is the only piece of identifying information that connects the two. If we don't have your social, we'll never get your FAFSA. So even though it's not required, it's optional, please put it on your application. Okay. Oops. All right. Drew, you're up. All right, so like Lori said, uh, FAFSA stands for the free application for federal student aid. Um, the FAFSA basically collects your demographic and financial information for the student and the parent. Um, it's typically filed electronically, and it's available in English and Spanish. All right, so also like Lori said, um, after October 1st, it's available for everyone. Um, so October 1st, so you fill it out prior to the academic year. So 23-24 one is now open. Um, most colleges set um, some filing deadlines and typically it's um, May 1st for the fall semester. So since there's two FAFSAs open right now, um, make sure you're clicking on the correct year because you don't want to fill out one for 22-23 and then you know not have the one for 23-24. So that's an important, important thing to remember there. Um, so dependency status, um, there's going to be I can't remember how many questions, but there's ten, but ten, ten dependency status questions. Um, if you say no on all those, you're considered a dependent. If you say yes to even one of them, you're considered independent. Um, this is important for like loan borrowing purposes. And then, so if you are independent, um, schools may require you, um, information to prove that. Um, and it doesn't matter if a student is dependent on the parents um, federal taxes or not. So when it comes to taxes, the easiest way to do that with the FAFSA is use the IRS um, data retrieval tool, the DRT. Um, it quickly transfers information from the IRS uh, to FAFSA um, and improves the accuracy, uh, reduces likelihood that you'll be selected for verification. And if you are, um, it reduces the documents that we have to reach out to you guys for. Um, everything is encrypted, so your information won't be shared. Um, your security and everything, and it will not be on your student aid report um, after it's uh, filed. Can you clarify which uh, tax that they should be using for taxes? It'd be 2021, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2021 tax year for the 23-24 FAFSA year. So, it 20, for, for, so for next fall, for the 23-24 school year, they should be using the 21? The 21, the 21 20, yep. Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be. Yeah, oh. Just my interruption with that data retrieval tool. If we had to send in a paper tax form because we had some tax fraud, will that still retrieve 2021 for doing that? Yeah, so, and then other examples that people cannot use um, the data retrieval tool are amended tax returns. Um, those who didn't enter a social security number and those that are married but filed taxes uh, separately. And now I'm going to turn it over to Carissa. Okay, so just like that, you've completed your FAFSA, right? So now, now what? Um, you'll receive uh, the student aid report. It's 
we call it the SAR, which will give you what your expected family contribution is. Now this is not the number of the aid that you're gonna receive. So you might see a number that says zero, it might say 5,000 something, it might say 20,000, it could be higher. That's just the number that's been calculated. There's a, there's a whole thing with the government that they go through. They look at your answers and they put together this calculation of what they think a family can then contribute to the education. So just keep in mind that's a number. Um, based on that number, we use it to calculate for grants, scholarships. It has to do with your need for loans. So just, just know it's very important when you're calculating, putting that information in. There's been a calculation that is run based off the information you've entered on your, on your FAFSA. Also, it goes to your email address. So we want to tell students, do not use your high school email address. You need to use an email address of your own that you can access after you graduate. Because remember, this FAFSA lasts your whole year after high school. So you want to be able to access it. And if you cannot get into your old high school email, then you don't, won't be getting updates. So make sure you use your own personal email address. You also don't want it to go to spam or have the school reject that email. So it's very important that you use your own personal email address because that's how you'll be informed of it because it will send it to you electronically that the SAR is available and then you'll click on that link and access it. When you list schools, you can list up to 10 schools on your FAFSA, and those schools will then be notified of your results from your FAFSA. We'll be notified of your EFC, we'll get notifications. So it's very important you think about the schools that you want to attend, and then make sure you list them. Make sure you know their school code and list them completely. If you go back in and you need to update it, you can do that. Just know every time you go in and touch your FAFSA, those schools are all notified every time you go in and make any changes to it. Okay, so as I mentioned, the expected family contribution, it's calculated based on the information you reported on your FAFSA. It's the figure we use to determine your financial need. And like I said before, it's not the amount of money. So don't be nervous when you see a, diff a large number or a small number, that's just a number that's used for us to determine what age you are eligible for. I have a question, but it's backing up. Okay, go ahead. So what if your son or daughter file taxes themselves? So when they fill out the FAFSA, just making sure I'm clear, will they have to report, and when they do their Social Security and sign in, they'll have to pull their own IRS data down? Right, so the student has their own financial data that they'll provide, and then the parents have their own okay. section to provide as well. I didn't know if that was automatic. No, you know, you'll have to go in and... Enter it. They can pull it by DRT. Right, but they have to make sure one is for the, the student has to pull theirs and then the parent has to pull theirs. Okay. Okay, after you've completed the FAFSA, you've received the SAR, let me recommend to you that when you get that information, you should review it. Make sure everything looks correct on it. Remember, that's a snapshot. Your FAFSA is a snapshot at the time you were completing it. So you're looking at your answers. If you're filling it out tonight, it's your snapshot as of today when we go through all the questions. And then you'll use your taxes from 2021. After that, when the school gets this information, they're now going to review it, run it through their system, decide what you may be eligible for. And then you'll receive something called an offer letter. So an offer letter is from a university telling you the age you are eligible for. And when you receive it, it varies based on the schools. A lot of them try to start, if you get your FAFSA done soon, try to get them out by November 1st so you can start thinking about it over the holidays. Make sure you compare those offer letters as well. You know, look at what one institution is offering you versus another, and then you can use that to help make your decisions. And just keep in mind, it's not actually a bill. It can always change. It's just to give you an idea of what you're eligible for at that particular university or college. Okay, so when you've decided on a school, you remember I said you could list those, unit, those different colleges? You can go in and remove the schools that you're no longer interested in, or you can contact and or contact the admissions office at those schools and let them know you're not interested in attending. Just know every time you do anything to your FAFSA, all those schools that are listed on it will receive updates and information. 
and they're putting together packages of financial aid for you. So it's courteous to give to reach out and let them know that you're no longer going to interested in attending. And also, you can go in and remove them, like I said, from the FAFSA. So if you have to make any changes to your FAFSA, they're not receiving updates if you're no longer interested in attending there. Okay, so I mentioned that you can be eligible for financial aid based on the FAFSA. These are some of the options we have. There's grants. Grants are need-based money without repayment. Things like federal Pell Grant, Ohio College Opportunity Grant, those are some of the grants that you can receive. Remember, those are things you do not have to pay back. There's scholarships that can be based on merit, performance-based. They can be something from your, your university. It can be um, something that you, it's an athletic scholarship. Or let's say it's something you're in honors. You're going into an honors program, so it's an honors scholarship. So there's different scholarships. Once again, those are things you do not pay back. We have work study. This is need-based campus jobs. You're, you can use your earnings to go towards tuition and fees. Most universities will tell you what you're eligible for. Just remember that you don't want to factor that into your bill because your student has to work and earn that money. So it's not guaranteed. It's just what they can be eligible for. But remember, they have to actually work those hours to earn the money. Yes, there's a question. How or when do they apply for like a work study? So they'll contact the university that they're going to, um, and then they can look for a job there. Each university is different on what platforms they use for how you apply for a job. But you'll work with your financial aid department to figure out what you qualify for, and then find those jobs. But they'll be closer to when you actually are attending. A lot of them are available, like starting early summer, are available to apply to get a fall job. You don't want to wait till fall to find a fall job, because a lot of times they're full. Do, uh, do they indicate in the FASFA that they're in a work study? Yes, there is a question. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, that's important that if you think you want to do work study, you can indicate that in the FASFA. Right, and just because it is listed on your financial aid package that you're eligible for it does not mean that you have to do it either. It's just one of the things that are offered by completing the FASFA. And then the last are federal loans. These are fixed low interest rate loans. Um, when you complete the FAFSA, you can qualify for a subsidized loan or an unsubsidized loan. Um, and that's all in the student's name, as Lori mentioned, and it's, you get qualified for it through the FAFSA. So does everyone get qualified for, for federal loans at some level? It de yes, and it depends what they, you may only qualify based on need for an unsubsidized loan versus a subsidized loan. But there are, it's, it's offered out to all students who complete, so complete the FAFSA. So what's the minimum amount then that like, like you said everyone gets something, an option for some type of loan, what is the, the minimum amount that someone can get? So 5,500 is the amount. Mm -hmm. so and then it goes up every year, so it, then it becomes 6,500, and then it caps at 7,500 between your junior and senior year, and that's for the undergraduate, for an so undergraduate. what does a family do? Maybe another slide for this. But what does a family do? They do the FAFSA and the vanilla tax information, and they, and they only qualify for like the minimal amount, which is 55 mm -hmm. dollars. But the price tag of the college is like $30,000. And they do like, they don't qualify for any grants because they make too much money. And then they get some scholarships, but they still have like, you know, $20,000 left. What do they do then? Okay, so these are the options I would tell you. Um, after you've exhausted all of the scholarships, look around as many local scholarships as you can find. Um, the next, you have options of applying for a private loan. Or if a parent is willing to sign for a loan, you can do a parent plus loan. So those are two options of loans. You can look at private loans. The student can apply for the private loan. Or the parents can apply for the loans as well. So the loans, the other thing is to look for, you can make payment plans at, the, at your institution and see if you can make arrangements for, to make payments. Can you define the difference between subsidized Sure, so, yep, so, <laughs> absolutely. So subsidized does not accrue interest, whereas unsubsidized does accrue interest. Now the great thing, these are government loans, right now based on everything that's happening, the unsubs are not 
you're not accruing interest right now, so that's, that's the great, great news, but just know that those eventually will accrue interest, um, and you're not required to start paying for them until you uh, drop below half time or you cease enrollment. So those are big things that students just need to be aware of, that they have the option to take those loans out, but they will be responsible for paying for them as, um, six months after they stop attending. Now subsidized loans do start to accrue interest once they graduate, but while they are in school, enrolled at least half time or more, they don't accrue interest. And here's the slide. There you go, the other, other financial aid options I mentioned. So private sources, I would also suggest you check um, with your employers. A lot of times there's programs offered, there's corporate partnerships set up where you can, your child can have a scholarship or a discount at an institution based on where you're employed. So definitely look at that. And like I said, when all else fails, reach out to your financial aid office and see what options they have for you. I think that getting us done now in October is great because now you will know how much you get and how much you need. Or if you wait until the spring, you don't know. So like, if you know now like you're only eligible for so much, you can talk to your son or daughter about, hey, Chipotle has a $5,000 tuition reimbursement program. If you work 15 hours a week for three months, go work with Chipotle, right? Or you know, all these, a lot of these fast food restaurants now have have like reimbursement, maybe something towards college, so a great opportunity for kids to, to start working towards that. And that's really a good point um, to have an open discussion with your child. Look at the tuition and costs for the institutions they're interested in and really talk about the affordability of it. You don't want it to be planning to move in and not know how you're going to cover your bill. So that just makes sure it's something you're thinking about and planning and preparing for it. I have a question, and this is for the counselors. Do we give a financial literacy class to the seniors on the risks of the government loan versus the private? I mean, the government loan goes to you, to you dead and beyond. I just wondered, do we discuss that with them? And you have to sign the master promissory note, so you are committing, you know, to it. So it's it's not we. It, while it's offered to you automatically, it doesn't guarantee you do have to do the steps. And a lot of times you'll be given more than you actually need. Um, and a lot of students take that and they're like, "Oh, I have a remaining like, check here for two grand," and then they live off of that. But it's stuff you got to pay back. Remember that. <laughs> And keep in mind, you can always refuse it if you get it. So just because it's listed on your offer letter doesn't mean you have to accept it. You can refuse it. And if you refuse it in the fall and something happens, you need it in the spring, you can just email us back and say, I changed my mind, I want my spring money. Or maybe I only want my subsidized, not my unsub, so I'm not paying interest. You can do that as well. We can be very flexible. You just have to keep communicating with your financial aid counselor. We will work through any situation with you and tweak as many alternatives as we can. That's what we're here for. Absolutely. Make sure you're checking out the school's websites. A lot of them have great information about financial aid, links to their scholarship information, loan detailed information. So make sure you're looking at those um, institutions, their their websites, and like Lori mentioned, do not hesitate to contact the financial aid office. You're doing a tour of the school, go in and meet with someone in the office and talk to them about it. They can tell you more specifics about that, that institution and their financial aid policy. Okay, so that's the end of our presentation. So 
Um, there's four of us here. Actually, we have Sonia Wagner with the University of Akron. She's also going to help um, answer any questions you may have if you want to stay here and work on completing your FAFSA. Do you do the DRT through your account or the kids' account? You can do both. Mm -hmm. Both. Because okay. yep. you have to provide both information. Okay. Right. Are there any other questions? Okay, you're welcome to come up and get your computer. If you like your computer, can we please give a round of applause?